Who killed five people for sure, and possibly many more in Central California in late 1968 and 1969, and then taunted the entire Bay Area with letters sent into the press revealing details of the crimes only the killer would know, threats of more violence, strange ciphers that if decoded would allegedly reveal the murderer's identity? Someone killed and killed again and again, all the while daring the police to discover their identity. Someone taunted an entire city for several years and then, just as mysteriously as they announced their presence, disappeared. Who is the Zodiac Killer? Will we ever know? Today, I present the details of the five murders we know he committed, details of a few other crimes he may have committed, examine the letters and ciphers he sent into the Bay Area press, and look at the most likely suspects. And then I make my guess as to who I think did it. And you can make yours. Murders, mystery, and a city that lived in fear. All that and more on today's taunting, threatening, and terrible time suck. You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or whenever the hell you're getting your suck on there, Time Sucker. I'm Dan Cummins, and this is the Cult of the Curious. This is Time Suck. Hail Nimrod. Thank you so much for all your wonderful emails this past week. Seems like I'm not the only one who got a little freaked out, uh, a little spooked by Monday's Shadow People episode. I uh, got a lot of spooky emails sent my way from you time suckers. Uh, some great time sucker Shadow People encounter stories uh, that I will share at the end of today's episode. And uh, welcome all you new time suckers who hopped on over here from the fantastic land of Foon and the uh, hello from the Magic Tavern podcast and also from the previous week's fantastic Astonishing Legends podcast. I uh, hope the Time Suck can provide your ear holes even more joy than they were already receiving. Uh, appreciate all the reviews. We are well uh, over 1,500 reviews now and ratings on iTunes, so you have at least three more bonus episodes heading your way. One every three weeks, starting on Friday, November 24th. I'll figure out a vote for what the topic should be for that bonus suck, the next one very soon, and post the choices on at Time Suck Podcast on Instagram like we've done the past few times. So thank you for for making that uh, bonus re- episode see, seem to be a regular every three-week occurrence now. As long as they keep rolling in, it's going to keep happening. Uh, some important new announcements. I, I just added a Detroit show. The doors are going to open at 7 p.m. on Friday, February 16th at the Magic Bag on 22920 Woodward Avenue in Ferndale. Cool Rock venue, where I'll be headlining a 7.30 show with James Petragallo and Jimmy Wisman, the guys from Small Town Murder and Crime and Sports. Tickets go on sale today. There is a link in the episode description. $20 for the show, which is a great price for a live show, all three of us. And if you want more live podcasts in your future, very important, if you live in the Michigan area, that you buy these tickets soon. If ticket sales go well in the following month, a 10 p.m. live swap cast podcast with James, Jimmy, and I is also going to go on sale. Basically, since I don't have a, a big track record of doing live podcasts, these venues want to know that the tickets can sell. Uh, sell. They want to know that the stand-up show is going to sell first, and then if that sells well, uh, they're willing to take a gamble on the, on the live podcast show. And then if that sells well, I can do many more live podcasts, some with James and Jimmy, some solo. But it, but it starts with the, the support of these first live shows. And, uh, and don't worry if you're like, you know, a, a true, uh, purist with time suck. You're like, oh, I don't know if I want one of these episodes to be a mashup. It's just, it's bonus. It's just for extra fun. It will not replace a Monday episode. It will, it will not replace a Friday bonus. episode. It's just even more suck out there and something special and unique. Uh, a nice hybrid of a tale told in parts by James, Jimmy and me, uh, just a fun mashup, you know, where we, we just break down a murderous tale together. I think it's going to be a lot of fun, especially to do in front of a live audience. I really love those guys. And, uh, and I need you guys, you time suckers to, to rally and make it happen. So again, you got to get those tickets soon, uh, for the Detroit show, or there will be no late night live podcast, which hurts the chances of there being future live podcasts anywhere else. Uh, also I'm in Dayton, Ohio for a few more shows this weekend. I'm in Spokane, Washington this coming week, November 9th through the 11th, Dr. Grins in Grand Rapids, Michigan, November 30th through December 2nd, St. Louis, funny bone, St. Louis, Missouri, December 7th through the 10th. Comedy Club on State in Madison, Wisconsin, December 14th through 16th. Appleton, Wisconsin was added on December 13th. One night only at Skyline Comedy Club in Appleton. And then rounding out the year at the Comedy Works in Denver, Colorado. I've heard it's one of the best clubs in the country. December 28th through New Year's Eve. Bunch of additional 2018 uh, dates will be posted soon on the website. And there's going to be a lot of just kind of one night here, one night there, test shows. See who can show up. 
uh, for one night. And if those go well, it, it, it'll bode well for my future as a comic and as a live podcaster. So come to the shows. Uh, all right. Now enjoy this suck in your ear holes right now uh, on The Zodiac Killer. Okay, so the tale of the Zodiac uh, starts, for sure at least, in late 1968 and lasts until the early 1970s. So we will start our tale in late 68 and we will march through a series of murders and cryptic messages before we break down who I think may have done it with a little Time Suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a Time Suck timeline. December 20th. 1968, the first murders unanimously attributed to the Zodiac Killer. The Zodiac has since been the suspected killer and a few other murders dating back to 1966, but 1968 is the year of the first definitive Zodiac homicides. David Faraday, age 17, and Betty Lou Jensen, age 16, were two young high school students out on their first official date. David was a popular high school student, an Eagle Scout, member of the Vallejo High School wrestling team. Betty Lou was a well-liked, hard-working student with excellent grades, two solid middle-class California kids with blue-collar families. Betty Lou's family had moved to California from Colorado. David's family was from the area. And according to Betty Lou's friend Sharon, Betty Lou had met David at a party a few months prior, uh, that night she, she she was killed. It wasn't really their first date. They had been seeing each other in secret for a couple months. Betty Lou's older sister, Melody, had gotten pregnant recently, married, and then divorced at a young age. So Betty Lou wasn't supposed to date at all. But she'd use me, Sharon says, as an excuse to get out of the house, and then she'd see David that way. So two teens, young and in love, in what should have been the very beginning of their uh, adult lives. The couple had attended a a pre-Christmas concert at Vallejo's Hogan High School. It was the last day of school before Christmas break, and it was also their first official date, as Betty Lou's parents had just given their consent for her to see David. The official plan was for them to go to a local restaurant slash diner called Mr. Ed's after the concert. Whether they actually made it there and grabbed a bite to eat or not is unknown. Mr. Ed's may have just been a, a cover. Uh, you know, it may have been like the official story, and the real plan was for those two bundles of teenage hormones to get to the makeout spot they were heading to later as quickly as possible. During the late evening hours of December 20th, they made it to an unlit area of the two-lane Lake Herman Gravel Road, somewhere near the jurisdictional line between Benicia and Vallejo, an area known to be frequented by young lovers seeking some privacy. Young couples looking to dry hump themselves into a horny mess of of blue balls and and wet panties. Sorry, I know a lot of women uh, hate the term wet panties. Uh, How about moist panties? Is Is that better? I'm pretty sure that's much, much worse, actually. Uh, but that's what we all know went on at the old makeout spot on Lake Herman Road. So back in 1968, the turnout were David and Betty Lou Park for some necking, for some heavy petting, some fooling around. At approximately 11 p.m., local residents Peggy and Homer Yore were returning from Sacramento, heading west on Lake Herman Road. Homer Yore, what an unfortunate name. That's an odd name. I bet he got teased a lot. Is your name seriously Homer Yore? Well, yes, it's Homer Yor. Why would I make up a name like that? Well, you think I haven't been teased my whole life? Homer the Boner. The Yor Boar. Let's take a snore. The Yor Boar's here. Where's your boner, Homer your Boner? Yor? Boner Yor? Homer? This boring? And stuff like that, but maybe not quite as wordy. Anyway, uh, Homer wanted to check out uh, check on some pipes as he, was, he worked for a construction company, laying pipes in the area. Probably also wanted to personally lay some pipe, so he drove his wife to the makeout spot. hey Sorry. Just went full bro there for a second. Uh, as they passed the turnout, Peggy Yore would uh, recollect in the police report, as they were driving west on Lake Herman Road at the turn off to the Benicia water pumping station, she observed a Rambler station wagon parked with front end heading east. There were two Caucasians in the front seat, male and female. When the lights from the car came upon the station wagon, the male sat up in the seat. I'm sure he did. Oh, 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 God. Miss, Mrs. Yor said it was a cold night and she noticed no frost on the station wagon. They proceeded toward the Marshall Ranch, approximately 30 seconds driving time beyond the turnout, where they encountered two raccoon hunters who would later be identified as Frank Gasser and Robert Connolly. As they turned into the gated entrance, they noticed one of the men had a long barreled gun, the other had a flashlight. They decided to reverse, head east back to Benicia. When they passed the turnout for a second time, the rambler of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen was still there. The time was a few minutes after 11 p.m. All right, so as of 11 p.m., these two uh, kids appeared to be fine. 
Nothing weird so far. Just a just a couple of raccoon hunters, you know, out hunting raccoons at eleven o'clock at night. Just doing a little nighttime raccoon hunting. Just get them critters. Go on, get them. Shoot them. Shoot them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shoot them. Yeah. As weird as that is, I realize it's not that crazy for country life. Uh, <laughs> And this area, while it would be much more urbanized and suburbanized now, uh, was pretty rural at this time. Uh, I grew up, you know, in a very country area, and I spent many a weekend as a kid growing up in Idaho watching my stepdad and his buddies just drink beer and shoot groundhogs on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, were the groundhogs popping out of their groundhog holes in search of human babies to smother in their cribs? You know, was it a justified killing? Just damn you, baby, smother an evil vermin. I'll shoot every last one of you on your holes. No, no, were the groundhogs bothering anyone in any way at all? No, they were not. Were, were, were they being hunted for their sweet, succulent groundhog meat? Get, get some of that tasty, lean groundhog bacon? No, of course not. Shooting groundhogs on the weekend was just a thing that people did because they were bored. Just for fun. Just a game of country whack-a-mole where instead of bonking a fake plastic creature on the head with a rubber mallet when they pop out of their little hole in the game, you, you just literally blew a real animal's head clean off when it popped out of its real hole, it, out of its home. <laughs> think about that for the animal it's just you know curled up in bed one second it's, oh, I think I'm gonna get out and stretch in the sun and then Pa-pa! just fucking exploded head ah the things people you know would do when the internet didn't exist and your, and your town didn't have a mall or a movie theater I'd probably still do it but I digress approximately between 11.05pm and 11.10pm David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen were parked up in Lake Herman Road turnout when it was believed the Zodiac Killer pulled up beside their Rambler and ordered them both out of the car with a twenty two handgun Firing off at least two warning shots that struck the Rambler, one bullet shattered the rear window lodged in their left rear wheel well, while the second bullet struck the headliner of the vehicle. Betty Lewis thought to have exited the passenger side of the Rambler, followed by David Faraday. What follows is subjective, but we do know that David Faraday was shot through the lower portion uh, lower portion of his left ear, causing a fatal brain injury, and fell to the rear of the vehicle. Betty Lou Jensen, apparently fearing the worst, either made a desperate attempt to flee or was ordered to run by her killer. Whatever the case, she was gunned down by five bullets to the right side of her back, succumbing at about 33 feet from the rear, uh, right rear of the Rambler and falling backwards. Minutes after the murders, at approximately 11.20 p.m., both victims were discovered lying on the gravel turnout by passing motorist Stella Medeiros. Uh, She had left her ranch situated 1.5 miles west of the Lake Herman Road turnout only minutes earlier, then raced off towards Benicia at high speed to alert the police. She eventually ran into Captain Daniel Pitta, who would recall arriving at the Lake Herman Road crime scene at at roughly roughly 11.28 p.m. Stella Medeiros uh, detailed her recollections on page 19 to 20 of the official police report for this incident. She states that no cars were going in either direction while she was on the road. When she arrived at the scene, headlights picked up the car and she observed a boy and he had looked like he had fallen out of the open door. The girl was lying on her side facing the road. She had a purple dress on and looked well-dressed. She saw only one car at the scene. It looked like a Rambler, grayish in color. It had a chrome rack on top. She states she drove 60 or 70 miles an hour en route to Benicia to report the incident. When she saw the police car, she honked her horn and blinked her lights to attract the attention of the police officers. When police arrived, David was still breathing, and Betty Lou Jensen was not. David was rushed from the scene and then pronounced dead on arrival at the nearby Vallejo Hospital at 12.05 a.m. Ten expended bullet casings were found strewn at the scene, one of which uh, was found on the front passenger side floorboard of the Rambler, and by the nature of bullet tracks found in the vehicle, it was considered the killer may have fired warning shots to force the couple from the car. However, no tire tracks or footprints were found in the turnout on account of the extremely cold temperature in Benicia on December 20th, 1968, falling to a low of 22 degrees Fahrenheit or negative five Celsius. Despite the aftermath of a rigorous investigation spearheaded by Sergeant Les Lundblad, Stationed in Solano County, the horrific murders went unsolved, the police never narrowing down the investigation to any notable suspects. Again with the names, Les Lundblad. Is it just me, or is that also an unfortunate name? It just, it doesn't paint a picture of someone on top of their game, right? Like, Like a kid saddled with the name of Les Lundblad. I just, probably not gonna become a CEO. I do feel, I do feel that names are somewhat important, you know? Like, I feel like I have a name that's not, like, great, but not horrible. It's just, it's just eh, it's average. Dan. It's a common, you know, it's, it's not noteworthy. It's not shitty. It's not cool. It's just, Dan. Eh, okay. And then Cummins, 
maybe kind of on the shitty side because of, <laughs> because of the cum reference. You know, you get a lot of that with the last name of Cummins. So you love junior high jokes. But, um, but again, you know, people grow out of that and it's not like, it's like a weird sound, you know, but, but Lundblad, Les Lundblad, like which sentence feels more accurate? Ladies and gentlemen, the 1969 recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize for Advancement in Molecular Biology, Les Lundblad. Or, ladies and gentlemen, a word from the Benicia Elks Lodge, number 47, semi-annual canned food drive committee, Sergeant of Arms, Les Lundblad. You, you, you decide. Various lines of motive were considered the initial Zodiac killings, including jealousy with Lundblad checking reports that included David Faraday clashing with another youth over Betty Lou Jensen on the Wednesday before the murders. Yeah, pretty typical, you know, young lover stuff, high school stuff. Crime scene investigators felt that David Faraday may have fought back against his attacker, but nothing ever came from the investigation. And at this point, the, the mystery man known as the Zodiac Killer had not announced his presence in taking credit for the murders. July 4th, 1969. The second confirmed attacks. Shortly before midnight, Darlene Elizabeth Farron, 22, and Michael Renau uh, Mazo, 19, pulled into the parking lot of the Blue Rock Springs Park in Vallejo, approximately six months and four miles apart from the Lake Herman murder site. Darlene was a married waitress with a young daughter working at nearby Terry's Waffle Shop. Uh, she was, shall we say, vivacious. Uh, she was married for the second time, but known around the time of her murder to be dating a lot of young men in the area, like a considerable amount, <laughs> including Michael. This was 1969, though, so maybe not as scandalous as it would be now. And I don't, and I don't say this to do any kind of what is, you know, now become known as slut shaming. Uh, by the way, I just include this detail of her promiscuity because it'll it'll come up again later in this story. Uh, we'll get back to one of these men later. Uh, Darlene actually may be the, the best key to finding the true identity of the Zodiac. Uh, if only she would have lived. She's like the one victim where people think later, like through interviews, maybe could have, you know, positively identified the killer. Anyway, years after her murder, uh, her sisters, Pam and Linda would talk to various reporters about their belief that one of the men she was dating is who killed her. Like I just said, apparently she had a stalker. Uh, however, uh, that's according to the sisters. However, no one told the police about the stalker during the initial investigation, which is a little troubling. Like, why would you wait when your sister had just been murdered to give important clues to help catch her attacker? Sadly, her sisters may have just wanted to exploit uh, all the interest in the Zodiac killer that would come, you know, in the subsequent years after her death to kind of gain attention for themselves. I don't know. Maybe they just weren't thinking clearly. Her sisters didn't exactly seem to have their shit together. And Pam in particular would end up on a lot of, uh, a lot of those kind of tabloid shows like Geraldo, Sally, Jesse, Raphael, Jerry Springer type programs, making all kinds of wild claims about the Zodiac killer and what she claimed she knew that she somehow didn't know back after the crime actually happened. Like, you know, like Darlene was part of a satanic cult, all kinds of weird shit. Nevertheless, we are going to come back to Darlene's story uh, later and about some of these possible men, one in particular that, that may have been the killer. So back to July 4th with Michael and Darlene, Michael, uh, knew both Darlene and her husband, uh, this one weird interview, uh, on a documentary I watched, he, he talks about like being buddies with the husband, but also dating Darlene. So, uh, okay. Uh, doesn't, uh, make sense. That wouldn't work in my household. That doesn't, doesn't add up for me, you know? Uh, I'm not gonna, you know, have my wife sleeping with, with some dude and know about that. Like apparently this, this guy claimed and also just be like, you know what? Yeah, he's fucking my wife. But, uh, that's okay. That's the, that's the glass half empty way to look at it. The glass half full is, you know, he comes around and he helps with the chores. Yeah, you know, he did the garbage out last night. Uh, he mowed the lawn last week, you know? Yeah. He bangs my wife a couple times a week, but he also is always showing up for poker night on time. So that's the positive. I don't know. Um, but anyway, this is Michael. He knew both Darlene and her husband. In fact, he, he and his brother had recently helped Darlene and her husband paint some rooms in the house, uh, part of a house painting party, uh, which I have heard of before, this, this story. It always sounds terrible. Like that's a, If you're not familiar with a house painting party, it's a you know, party, quote unquote, where in exchange for beer and pizza, you exploit a bunch of your friends into helping you paint your house instead of doing it yourself or paying someone to do it. And if you're throwing one of these parties, I feel like there's a decent chance you're an asshole. Uh, and it sounds like Darlene invited over a bunch of dudes. She was, uh, either banging or had banged or was leading to believe, uh, you know, making them you know, feel like that she may bang them in the future. Uh, and then to, to help paint her place and her, and her husband was there too. Again, how fucking awkward. This guy is like the definition of a cuckold, you know, just this poor cuckold, just, 
at, at this party, I can just imagine, just, hey, baby, this is Steven. Uh, he's the mechanic who fixed my car for free last week. Remember, you thought that was weird. He just, yeah, no, he fixed it for free. I uh, like your jeans, Steven. Is that, is that a roll of quarters in your pocket? Or have you been looking at my skirt while you've been holding my ladder for painting? <laughs> oh, you tomcat. Uh, baby, this is Michael. Uh, he lived down the street, uh, wanted to come paint our, our, our place uh, for hours, just for fun, I guess. He's just friendly and real good with his fingers. Uh, he plays guitar or or something. <laughs> he strums something. Isn't that right, Michael? Mm. And uh, baby, this is Donnie, James, Lee, Ronald, and Jamal. Remember when I came home uh, a few weeks ago with my hair messed up and a few bruises on my legs and I was pregnant? Well, these are the guys that took me to the abortion clinic after we played some basketball and all showered up together at the YMCA. Uh, baby, this is John, Lucas, this is Fong, Paco, Andre, Silvio, Thor, this is Nathan, Nathan's father Jack, Zeke, Zeke's cousin Jimmy, Arlo, Mikhail, Jr. Uh, I volunteered to judge a pocket pool tournament, and well, yeah, you get the idea. Anyways, <laughs> at least according to interviews later, Michael was convinced that Darlene was going to leave her husband and marry him. Uh, quite the charmer, this Darlene. She apparently cast a pretty powerful spell. Michael also claimed that his twin brother, Steve, uh, was also dating Darlene. I mean, for fuck's sake. Uh, Michael and Darlene, just like David and Betty Lou before them, uh, had plans to visit Mr. Ed's diner uh, and also chose to skip it and head to another lover's lane. Man, if only Mr. Ed's would have had better food. You know, all these people might actually have went there and eaten instead of just using it for a cover uh, and still be alive. Uh, while sitting in a parked car at the Blue Rock Springs Park parking lot, some local teens set off some firecrackers startling Michael and Darlene. Scenes laid out pretty well, actually, in the 2007 movie Zodiac, uh, starring everyone. It's actually a really good movie. Uh, really long, about two and a half hours. Stars Jake Gyllenhaal, Mark Ruffalo, Robert Downey Jr., Anthony Edwards. Remember him from ER? Uh, Brian Cox, Close, uh, Chloe Sevigny, uh, Dermot Mulroney. Such a good cast. Uh, Dermot's one of those guys where it's like, you might not recognize the name when you see his face. You're like, oh yeah, I fucking love that guy. Uh, 89% approval on Rotten Tomatoes as well. Well, anyway, the firecracker uh, pranksters, they take off, leaving the couple alone for a moment in the parking lot. Then a few other uh, cars come and go. Then the Zodiac shows up. About five minutes before the shooting occurred, a vehicle pulled into the lot, coming from the direction of Springs Road in Vallejo. The driver turned the lights off on the car, pulled around to the left or east side of the car, approximately six or eight feet away, sat there for a minute, and then left. Michael asked Darlene if she knew who it was. She seemed to insinuate that she did, but then stated... Ah, never mind. Damn it. If she would have just said a fucking name, this guy may not have killed any more people. But she didn't. According to Michael, approximately five minutes later, the same brown car, thought to be a Chevrolet Corvair, Ford Mustang, returns. This time draws up to within 10 feet of the rear of their car, slightly to the right side. Only this time, uh, the lone driver exits the vehicle, carrying what Michael described as a high-powered flashlight, the type you carry with the handle, and although not known at the time, was in possession of a 9mm Luger. Then he casually approached the couple's car, believing the person to be a policeman. Because of his demeanor, because of the light, Michael reached for some personal identification, at which point the man raised the gun and, without uttering a word, fired five rounds at point-blank range through the window, striking Michael and Darlene several times each. Uh, Michael stated he heard a muffled sound, surmising the gun sounded like it had a silence on it. The first shot hit him uh, right kind of in the face. A face, neck. Uh, George Bryant, the son of a caretaker at Blue uh, Rock Springs Park, was in bed at his house, located just 800 feet from the parking lot, also heard these shots. He would recall later that he could hear laughing and a few firecrackers being shot off, but he couldn't see anybody. At approximately midnight, he heard what appeared to be a gunshot that was much louder than any of the firecrackers. A short time later, he heard what appeared to be another gunshot. After another short pause, he heard rapid fire of what appears to be gunshots. He then heard a car taking off at super speed and burned, and it burned rubber and was squealing its tires as it sped along the road. He wasn't sure if its direction of travel. He didn't check as it was the 4th of July and thought it was just somebody celebrating. Well, the fact uh, uh, that George Bryant seemingly heard gunshots tends to negate the premise that the weapon had a silencer or suppressor attached, you know. Uh, the more reasonable suggestion being that, that Michael, you know, Mazzo, was just temporarily deafened by the first gunshot so close to his head. Immediately after the attack began, Michael, in a bid to prevent further injury or blind terror, uh, propelled himself to the rear passenger seat. After the five initial shots, the shooter retreated, but then reapproached the car when Michael started to yell, and then he shot Michael and Darling each twice more. Then he calmly walked away and got back in his car. Michael stated he grappled for the outside door handle and fell out onto the Blue Rock Springs car park, at which point the shooter fled at a high rate of speed. From the scene, 
in the direction of Vallejo and Springs Road. A short time later, three other 4th of July revelers showed up, saw a bloody Michael sitting outside his car, quickly found a phone, reported the attack to the police. Richard Hoffman and Ed Rust were the two were two of the first responding officers that night. When Ed Rust arrived, he noticed Hoffman tending to Michael Mazzo, who was lying on his back on the ground by the open door of the car. Darlene Farron was observed motionless behind the steering wheel of the car. Ed Rust tried to ask Darlene Farron what happened. She was still alive. She did mumble something, but he could not distinguish what she said. Uh, she just wasn't able to speak clearly due to the severity of her injuries. Both were rushed to the hospital, but despite Darlene Farron receiving extensive cardiopulmonary, cardio, cardiopulmonary resuscitation from the ambulance crew that night, she finally succumbed to her multiple injuries. Sadly, Darlene Farron was pronounced dead at 12.38 a.m., upon her arrival at the hospital. Miraculously, Michael Mazzo, who took the initial brunt of the cold-blooded attack, survived and was later at his bedside uh, able to give a description of the killer to investigating detective Ed Rust, stating he was a heavyset man standing about 5 foot 8 inches tall, beefy build, you know, but not like blubbery fat. That's his words. I love but he was, he was beefy but not blubbery. Uh, possibly 195 to 200 pounds, short curly hair, light brown, almost blonde. He added that the man was not wearing glasses, but stressed that his assailant did possess a particularly large face. On July 5th, at 12.40 a.m., approximately 40 minutes after the attack, a call was received from a phone booth at the gas station of Springs Road in Tulum, close to Farron's home, where the Zodiac Killer made his presence known. Claiming responsibility for the attack at Blue Rock Springs Park and also the previous Lake Herman Road murders, the police dispatcher who took the call in the early hours of July 5th, 1969, was 26-year-old Nancy Slover. She was to become one of only three people to speak directly to the Zodiac Killer. Nancy Slover described his voice and tone as though he was mocking and taunting her for shock value, claiming it worked. The caller, the caller spoke the following words in a monotone, rehearsed fashion. I wish to report a double murder. If you will go one mile east on Columbus Parkway to a public park, you will find the kids in a brown car. They have been shot by a 9 millimeter Luger. I also killed those kids last year. Goodbye. Yeah, this is like some weird sing-songy goodbye. For the first time, the man who'd become known as the Zodiac Killer had spoken with authorities. Sadly, this call was never recorded, as police dispatcher Nancy Slover did not have the equipment at her disposal to record incoming calls at the time. And if only technology had been a little more advanced back then, there would be no Zodiac mystery today. The, the main reason the Zodiac murders remain unsolved is because of the era the crimes took place in. Had this happened today, the Zodiac's call would have been blasted out, you know, it would have been recorded, and then blasted out by news outlets across the country to hear on TV, radio, the web, and odds are someone would recognize the voice. Someone would recognize the cadence, you know, and, and there'd be a tip. But this is 1969, and it didn't work out that way. Also, knowing what we uh, know about human memory now, uh, and knowing that Nancy Slover, the police dispatcher, attempted to talk over Zodiac to acquire details and didn't immediately write down this message after receiving it, at, at best, this, close, uh, this quote is just kind of close to verbatim. It's close to a, you know, it's like a paraphrase of what was actually said. Best, to, to her best memory, that's what was said. On July 31st, three separate letters were mailed by the Zodiac killer to three different Bay Area newspapers. This is the first time uh, that investigators at this time know that he actually sent something to the press. Well, we'll later we'll come up uh, against some previous incidents where he, whoever the Zodiac killer was may have actually sent some things in back in 1966. Uh, there's a good possibility that he did, but this is the first for sure letters. And they were sent to the Vallejo times Herald, the San Francisco Chronicle and the San Francisco examiner. And the letter to the Vallejo times or Vallejo times Herald stated Dear editor, I'm the killer of the two teen teenagers last Christmas at Lake Herman and the girl last 4th of July. To prove this, I shall state some facts which only I plus the police know. 1. Brand name of ammo, Super X. 2. 10 shots fired. 3. Boy was on back feet to car. Boy was on back feet to car. <laughs> that makes way more sense than the way I read it at first. He was on his back feet. There's apparently there's a four-legged boy. Uh, four, girl was lying on right side, feet to west. Fourth of July, girl was wearing patterned pants. Uh, that's the first one in, in, that, in that crime scene. Two, boy was also shot in knee. Three, brand name of ammo was Western. Here is a cipher. This is part of one. And I'm reading this as he wrote him. Like his, he doesn't spell that well. And his and he adds words in weird places, so that's why it sounds kind of kind of fucked up because that's the way he wrote it. The other two parts have been mailed to the SF Examiner 
Examiner plus the SF Chronicle, I want you to print this cipher on your front page by Fry afternoon, August 1 through 6, 9. <laughs> if you do... If not, if you do not do this, I will go on kill rampage Friday night that will last the whole weekend. I will cruise around and pick of all pick off, I'm assuming, all stray people or couples that are alone, then move on to kill some more until I have killed over a dozen people. And then the letter is signed by uh, this symbol that would become known as the zodiac symbol. It's like a vertical line intersected by a perfectly perpendicular horizontal line of roughly equal length. Uh, and, you know, intersecting each other at their, at the line centers. And then there's a circle encompassing this intersection. Uh, it's like a crudely drawn gun target is what it reminds me of. The two other letters said virtually the exact same thing, but then, you know, each included a different third of the cipher, a coded message. These coded messages are kind of what the Zodiac would become, I guess, uh, most famous for, uh, a grid of letters, astrological signs, symbols, geometric shapes, uh, worked into a code only the Zodiac knew but one that, you know, theoretically could be cracked and, and some would be cracked. Uh, all three papers published letters that week, although not all published them on the front page. The Chronicle published its third of the cryptogram on page four of the next day's edition, an article printed alongside the code, quoted Vallejo Police Chief Jack E. Stilts as saying, we're not satisfied that the letter was written by the murderer. And they requested the writer to send a second letter with more facts to prove their identity. Despite not getting front page treatment, the threatened murders did not happen. The Zodiac did, however, send another letter on August 4th. August 4th, the Zodiac sent the following letter to the San Francisco Examiner, the first letter he identifies himself in uh, as the Zodiac. Dear Editor, this is the Zodiac speaking. In answer to your asking for more details about the good times I have had in Vallejo, I shall be very happy to supply even more material. By the way, are the police having a good time with the code? If not, tell them to cheer up. When they do crack it, they will have me. On the 4th of July, I did not open the car door. The window was rolled down already. The boy was originally sitting in the front seat when I began firing. When I fired the first shot at his head, he leaped backwards at the same time, thus spoiling my aim. He ended up on the back seat, then the floor in back, thrashing out very violently with his legs. That's how I shot him in the knee. I did not leave the scene of the killing with squealing tires, plus racing engine, as described in the Vallejo paper. I drove away quite slowly so as not to draw attention to my car. The man who told the police that my car was brown was a Negro, about 40 to 45, rather shabbily dressed. I was at this phone booth having some fun with the Vallejo cops when he was walking by. When I hung the phone up, the damn thing began to ring and and that drew his attention to me and my car. Last Christmas, in that episode, the police were wondering as to how I could shoot and hit my victims in the dark. They did not openly state this, but implied this by saying it was a well-lit night and I could see the silhouettes on the horizon. Bullshit. That area is surrounded by high hills plus trees. What I did was tape a small pencil flashlight to the barrel of my gun. If you notice in the center of the beam of light, if you aim it at a wall or ceiling, you will see a black or dark spot in the center of the circle of light, about three to six inches across. When taped to a gun barrel, the bullet will strike exactly in the center of the black dot in the light. All I had to do was spray them as if it was a water hose. There was no need to use the gun sights. I was not happy to see that I did not get front page coverage. Then, just a few days later, on August 8, 1969, Donald and Betty Harden of Salinas, California, cracked the original 408 symbol cryptogram, which is amazing to me, uh, because I am horrible at riddles and things like that. Like, re like really, really bad. Like, I've played games with a variety of other people where you have to solve uh, riddles. Easily the worst almost every single time I've played. Uh, I'm pretty sure I don't have whatever part of the brain requires you to do that. Or uh, constant binge drinking in my young uh, adult life killed whatever brain cells you need for that. Uh, I, feel, I feel like if I was assigned to crack and that eventually I would just, just get so frustrated, I would just make up shit. Just, you know, yeah, well, I did crack it. Yeah, no, I got it. I got it. I got it. Uh, do I have my notes? No, nah, no, nah, that's that's for me. Does a magician reveal his secrets? No, I'm, I'm the code breaker. I keep my code breaking notes to myself. Here's what it is for sure. He says that he loves Fruit Loops. Says they taste good and they have lots of vitamins. So what's the big deal? 
if a grown man wants to eat them, you know? He says, uh, he says grown up should be able to eat Froot Loops and not be made fun of by the grown ups. Uh, and he says, unless every diner in San Francisco starts to carry him, more people are going to die. Are you, are you sure that's what it says? Don't you like Froot Loops? Hey, hey, you fucking, you see that little circle symbol? That's a loop. See that triangle thingy? That's an ancient uh, Egyptian symbol for fruit. I don't think that's true. Hey, who's the official decoder? You or me? It's me. I'm fucking telling you. You want some fucking Froot Loops? I don't know. That's, I'd probably, I'd, I'd snap. Okay, here's what the message really said. It said, uh, I like killing people because it is so much fun. It is more fun than killing wild game in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all. To kill something gives me the most thrilling experience. It is even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. The best part of it is that when I die, I will be reborn in paradise. And they have killed those, I don't know, T-H-E-I, and fucking, and those people who have, have, I've killed will become my slaves. I will not give you my name because you will try to slow down or stop my collecting of slaves for my afterlife. And again, it's like full of misspellings. So that's why my pauses are there. And then there were uh, 18 additional letters at the end that either just haven't been deciphered or are just complete, absolute gibberish. It's just, uh, part of what made these messages, uh, you know, tough to decode is that while the Zodiac killer did not, did know how to code a message, you know, it wasn't just nonsense. I mean, there was a code, somebody cracked it. He just, uh, he's a terrible speller. So that probably, you know, uh, you know, makes it very hard to decode when some of the words you're going to be decoding the symbols into are not actually real words. Tons of misspellings. Okay. September 27th, 1969, the Zodiac kills again. Uh, I consider this to be his most disturbing attack. This afternoon, 20-year-old Brian Hartnell ran into an old girlfriend, 22-year-old Cecilia Shepard, and suggested they drive to Lake Berryessa, a scenic reservoir, about 45 minutes east of Napa, not far from the Pacific Union College where they were both students. They found a secluded spot next to the water's edge, spread out a blanket so they could relax and catch up. That's that's how that's how the article describes so they could catch up, quote unquote. I love how all the news reports from these killings back then uh, refer to these romantically linked young couples. Uh, heading out to secluded makeout spots in the isolated areas to either like talk or catch up. They're just trying so hard to be proper. They weren't catching it, catching up. They were knocking it out. You catch up over coffee with other people around when you're young and you have roommates, you know, or still live with your parents, you head out to a secluded area to fuck. (laughs) I think laying a blanket out in the woods, out in the secluded area of woods was the late 1960s versions of today's Netflix and chill. Right, I used to invite girls over to watch a movie alone at my place, and the intention was never to quietly talk or catch up or watch a movie. Anyways, uh, Cecilia Shepard, Brian Hartnell were enjoying a picnic area, knocking it out at a remote location on Lake Berryessa called Twin Oak Ridge. It was a little before 6 p.m. when Cecilia noticed a man in the distance acting strangely. Shortly thereafter, the man snuck behind a tree, and when he emerged, he was wearing a costume with a hood and a long bib. Uh, prominent on the front was the now famous symbol used as a send off in the Zodiac letters. Uh, it was all black. Uh, the, you know, the hood and the bib with this like, uh, Zodiac symbol uh, on the front, I believe it was white. Um, and the later police sketch his outfit. It looked like an, uh, like an old hangman's hood, like an executioner kind of mask. Super creepy. Like when you see a man dressed like this, heading towards you with a gun, especially uh, a good part of you has to know there's zero chance you're talking your way out of whatever's coming up. You know, you know that at the very least, an extreme amount of violence is in your future. You know, uh, and you know that most most likely they're trying to kill you. You have to know that. So the man in the creepy black hood approaches a couple, aims a gun at him, claims to be a recent escapee from some Montana prison, I think somewhere around Lincoln, Montana, uh, needed money to get to Mexico. Brian offers the man his wallet. The intruder is not interested. Instead, he uh, pulls some clothesline from his pocket and demands that Cecilia tie Brian up. Uh, when she was finished, uh, he used the clothesline to bind her as well, and then he hogtied both of them. And if you don't know what that is, it's when you have your hands tied together behind your back, you then have your feet tied together, and then your hands tied to your feet behind your back. You can Google hogtied, but uh, be careful uh, where you where you are when you Google it and who's around. Uh, I did it at a coffee shop when I was doing my research, and almost nothing but porn sites came up. Uh, do not do a Google image search for, for hogtied. Uh, in a public place, unless you're very comfortable uh, with everyone around you seeing images delivered uh, by sweet uh, Lucifina herself, sexy temptress of time suck. That siren doing her best to lure me away from my research and instead send me to places like kink.com, Pornhub, RedTube, Hogtide.com. 
other places full of pictures of people doing something far more exciting and unusual with their day than, than I am. Uh, apparently getting hogtied is super popular in the world of BDSM. Uh, I didn't quite realize that. And, and if I were going to do that, uh, I'm going to say that I need to be the person doing the tying. Yes, I did look at some images. Of course I did. Uh, I'm not going to be the person being tied up. Holy shit, being hogtied has zero appeal for me. It doesn't, it's not that I don't even trust my wife, uh, but it just doesn't sound fun at all. Like, especially when you get the, the, the gag ball put in your mouth. A lot of people in the pictures had gag balls in their mouth. Like, what if, what if you suddenly have to go to the bathroom real bad? How do you let anybody know that? How can you, how can you have a safe word if you got a gag ball in your mouth and you're fucking hogtied? That's lots of lot to sign up for, man. That's putting a lot of faith in your partner. <laughs> what if you have gas all of a sudden? Like, a lot of gas, you know? What if, what if you get a cramp? Like, what if you get one of those weird bad cramps you get in your calf, the kind that wake you up in the middle of the night? What if, what if in all the weird t- being twisted around and hogtied, you slip a disc in your back? Right? And you got to get to the, you got to get a fucking muscle relaxer, got to the hospital. What if you just suddenly remember, wait, wait a minute. Why did I do this? I fucking hate this. This is a horrible idea. Please untie me. No, no thanks on hog time for me. Holy shit though. I can't imagine the level of terror those two poor people ha- uh, felt that day. This armed hooded dude claiming he just escaped from prison. This guy wearing an executioner's mask, fucking holding a gun. He has you hog tied out in the woods. Man, what a buzz kill. Minutes earlier, you're getting on with your old flame on a blanket by the water. Now this asshole shows up. Then, of course, you know, it gets worse when the hooded man produces a long wooden handled knife with a 10 to 12 inch blade. Then it gets way worse when he starts stabbing the shit out of you two repeatedly. Cecilia is stabbed 10 times. Brian is stabbed six times. Again, you can see this played out in the movie Zodiac, which seems to do a pretty good job of accurately portraying a lot of the details of the Zodiac killings. Uh, Cecilia screams, thrashes as she's stabbed. As I imagine one is likely to do in that situation. Man, my God. The Zodiac continues to stab her until she's quiet. Brian is somehow able to play dead after six stab wounds, and he survives. Not sure how you pull that off, unless your body starts to go into shock at that point or something, and the pain of each subsequent stab wound just is considerably less than the previous ones. After the hooded man left, Brian manages to get the attention of a fisherman passing by in a boat, who then speeds off for help, uh, which is great. You know, uh, Great that he goes for help. Not so great that he leaves Brian hogtied. Not sure how that call was determined, you know? I I would think you would pull up and, uh, you know, untie Brian and Cecilia, put him in a boat, take him to a doctor, something, but I don't know, maybe the water didn't allow the boat to reach the shore in that spot. Uh, Maybe the fisherman wasn't strong enough to carry either of them to the boat. Uh, Maybe he really just didn't want to risk being hogtied, Uh, which, uh, you know, uh, pretty reasonable. You know, just, please, help us! Help us! We've been stabbed! Um, Oh my God, you've been stabbed? All right, I'll, I'll be back with help. Okay. Can't you untie us and take us with you? What? I, I didn't I didn't catch that last part. I'm gonna go for help now. How could you not hear that? You're in the same spot you were when you heard me yell the first time. Uh, okay then, can't hear you still. I'm taking off for help since I that's what all I heard was that part. After the fisherman leaves, uh, and then Brian slash real life Superman manages to get loose from his ties and climb up towards the road from the shore and he alerts a park ranger. You know, no big whoop. It's not like he was hogtied, stabbed with a fucking foot-long knife half a dozen times or anything. Uh, the ambulance takes in, uh, over an hour to arrive. Brian survived. Of course he did. It's not like Zodiac had kryptonite that would be necessary to destroy him. Uh, Cecilia actually was still alive when the ambulance uh, arrived, also dying a few hours later. She was really tough as well, apparently, somehow not immediately dying from 10 stab wounds. When recovered in the hospital, Brian Hartnell described the attacker as heavyset between 225, 250 pounds, about 5'8", 5'10", having brown hair. He could see the edges, you know, uh, inside the hood. This aligned with the description, you know, provided by uh, Mike Maja, or Mike Maza. Uh, At the scene, police found a hand-scrawled message on the door of Brian's VW Carmen Ghia, which is an awesome vintage car, by the way. I didn't know about this model. Super slick-looking little two-door coupe. Man, much sexier and more masculine, in my opinion, than the Beetle. Uh, on the passenger door of this coupe was a message from the Zodiac. The message listed the dates of the two previous Vallejo killings attributed to the Zodiac, along with his new third date, uh, you know, third killing date. Near the car, police also found a size 10 and a half shoe print that matched a military boot called Wing Walker. Based on the pressure, it was determined that the wearer was probably, yeah, around 200, 220 pounds, so in the range the two witnesses described. About an hour after the attack, uh, Napa police received a call from a phone booth in downtown Napa, 27 miles away, from a man taking responsibility for the crime, telling police where to find the bodies. The police raced to the phone booth, but the man was long gone. They were, however, able to grab a latent set of prints that could have come from the killer. Officer Dave Slate took the call and heard the killer utter the words, I want to report a murder. 
No, a double murder. They are two miles north of Park headquarters. They were in a white Volkswagen Carmen Ghia. Then after a brief pause, said, I'm the one that did it, and hung up. No letter was sent to the press immediately following these killings. Nope, instead, two weeks later, on October 11th, 1969, the killer struck again, this time right in San Francisco. Paul Stein was a 29-year-old husband and student who had moved to San Francisco from nearby Modesto and was studying at San Francisco State University, where he was working towards earning his doctorate in English. To pay for school, he worked nights at the Yellow Cab Company. At 8.45 p.m. on the evening of October 11th, Stein reported for work. He's, uh, he's given a waiting fare from Pier 64, uh, San Francisco, to the San Francisco airport. He picks up his fare at approximately 9.20, drives to the airport, and then rather than wait in the long queue for an airport pickup fare, he, he decides to head to the theater district slash downtown, which was, you know, known to be busy this time. 9.45, he receives radio dispatch at 509th Avenue. This address is in the Richmond district of San Francisco, about 3.3 miles from his current location with a traveling time of about 13 minutes. As he heads to the new fair, Stein is hailed by a single male on foot who requested a destination of Washington and Maple Streets. Although this was not the most convenient direction for his planned, or, you know, previously planned destination uh, for the, the pickup he has scheduled, it's close enough that he could deliver his, his new fare, cut across a few city streets, make it to the scheduled fair on 9th Avenue in a reasonable amount of time. So just before 10 p.m., Stein uh, drives past Washington and Maple to Cherry Street to drop off this uh, intermediary fare, I guess, stops his taxi, and then is immediately shot at point-blank range on the right side of the back of his head and dies instantly. Police arrive at the scene minutes later, and at 10 minutes after 10 p.m., he's pronounced dead on the scene. From a house on the opposite side of the street, three teenage eyewitnesses heard the gunshot, saw the subsequent details of the crime, as the killer removed a rear section of, they, they saw the killer remove a rear section of the victim's shirt, saw him wipe down various parts of the taxi, uh, including the driver's side compartment, the exterior uh, right front passenger uh, portion of the car, the external driver's side door handles. Soon after the teen, uh, he he does this, the teenagers ring the police. Their call came in at 9:58 p.m. However, crossed wires or misinterpretation of the telephone call or uh, basic racism uh, caused the radio operator to unfortunately inform patrolmen to look out for a black male, which would ultimately benefit the murderer just a few short minutes later and uh, in what would turn out to be the best chance the police would ever have of capturing the elusive Zodiac killer. When the first police officers arrived in the area, officers Donald Falk and Eric Zelmans observed a heavyset white male, approximately 5'10", uh, 35 to 45 years old, roughly 200 pounds, walking near the intersection of Jackson and Maple Street, and they didn't question him due to the description uh, mix-up. Little racial profiling lets the Zodiac killer just fucking walk away. Damn it. The officers uh, respond to what they thought at the time, or you know, are responding to what they think at the time is, is an assault and robbery of a taxi. Uh, they don't realize it's a, it's a murder, and they don't, certainly don't realize it's one committed by uh, you know the Zodiac killer. Well, on October 13th, the Zodiac sends another confession letter and a piece of a blood-stained shirt to the San Francisco Chronicle, saying, This is the Zodiac speaking. I am the murderer of the taxi driver over by Washington Street and Maple last night. To prove this, here is a blood-stained piece of his shirt. I am the same man who did in the people in the North Bay area. The San Francisco police could have caught me last night if they had searched the park properly instead of holding road races with their motorcycles, seeing who could make the most noise. The car drivers should have just parked their cars and sat there quietly waiting for me to come out of cover. School children make nice targets. I think I shall wipe out a school bus some morning. Just shoot out the front tire, then pick off the kitties as they come bouncing out. Wow. Well, the park the killer referred to is likely a wooded area of the Julius Kahn playground and invest area investigators did search, but not as thoroughly as they probably, you know, could have. Uh, you know, they clearly did not find the killer there. A large search was conducted minutes after the killing, but by this time, investigators, you know, uh, once they were looking for the correct suspect description, it was probably too late. And, you know, just because he said he was hiding there doesn't mean he was. He was known to, to lie a fair amount in his letters just to harass the police as well. So he could have noticed them looking in the park as he walked off and been completely out of the area. Anyway, the Zodiac's threat to assassinate school children terrifies kids and parents everywhere in the Bay Area, as it should have, created a nightmare of security concerns for police and school officials. Whole city is scared in the fall of 1969. This sick motherfucker has killed at least five people in Central California in the past 10 months, killed, uh, you know, uh, nearly killed two others. 
uh, you know, has now killed right in San Francisco proper, and he has been taunting local press and authorities about the murders for a little over two months, and no one has any idea who's doing it. Think about the level of paranoia going on right now. The police and papers are being bombarded with reports of someone thinking their neighbor is a Zodiac killer or their coworker or their, you know, their brother-in-law. Crazy people are showing up police stations claiming that they are the Zodiac killer. You know, two years removed from being the heart of 1967, summer of love, it is now the fall of fear and paranoia. Armed men are escorting children to and from schools while patrol cars and even aircraft are following along and monitoring the surrounding area. Whoever did this was fucking loving it. Right in late 1969, one man terrorizing millions, one man making the police look like fools, making reporters look like idiots. Must have been hard for the Zodiac to walk around at this time. Just a constant satisfaction and power and control boner just raging out of the top of his jeans. As media coverage of Zodiac's murderous plans increase and fears of a horrific ambush grow, a uh, local television uh, station it becomes a setting for another chilling scene with the Zodiac. Just under two weeks later, in the early morning hours of October 22nd, 1969, the Oakland Police Department received a phone call from a man claiming to be the Zodiac. The caller said he wanted famous Boston attorney F. Lee Bailey to appear on a local television talk show, but told the operator that he would settle for San Francisco lawyer Melvin Belli. In the event, uh, Bailey was unable to appear. Well, hours later, Belli uh, would be the guest on the show with host Jim Dunbar. A man called the KGO television station several times and in conversation with Belli claimed he was a Zodiac and that his real name was Sam. One exchange revealed that Sam had been interested in Belli for quite some time. Okay, so I'm going to play some of a recording of this call-in. Sorry for the hum. Uh, this is the best quality recording I could find uh, of this event. Talk to us. Just tell us what's going on in, in, inside you right now, Sam. That's Please. Dunbar talking. I have headaches. Right. How long have you had those headaches? That's the lie. Been a long time since I killed a kid. And then he just kind of goes on to, to, to ramble on, you know, uh, for the most part, and then every once in a while say something outrageous. Like at one point he just threatens, you know, I'm going to kill those kids. Uh, Belli persuades Sam to meet with him in person, but due to the media circus surrounding the secret meeting, no one is surprised when Sam fails to appear uh, at the great agreed-upon location, because there's all kinds of police and reporters around. Efforts to trace Sam's call to the KGO switchboard were unsuccessful. However, uh, that didn't matter that they were unable to trace the calls, and it didn't matter that he didn't show up, because it probably was not him. Very highly likely that it was not the Zodiac Killer that was, that was talking there. Scared the shit out of the city. I'm sure the real Zodiac got a big kick out of it, but uh, Brian Hartnell, the surviving Zodiac stabbing victim, and the two other police dispatchers who had spoken with the real Zodiac after listening to audio tapes uh, of the caller's voice during this call all agreed that this Sam was an imposter. And this imposter, you know, he had just proved how much power the Zodiac held over the city of San Francisco. On November 8th, 1969, the real Zodiac once again corresponds with the press, mailing a card in a 340-character cipher to the San Francisco Chronicle. The front of the card features an image of a wet pen hanging from a string and says, Sorry I haven't written, but I just washed my pen. Inside it says, This is the Zodiac speaking. I thought you would need a good laugh before you hear the bad news. You won't get the news for a while yet. P.S. Could you print this cipher on your front page? I get awfully lonely when I am ignored. So lonely, I could do my thing. Lots of exclamation points after thing there. Thing is in caps. I mean, this asshole is just so happy with himself. Must have been so hard not to share his joy with someone, just anyone. Kind of remarkable in a way that he could keep such a powerful secret to himself. I couldn't. If I had an entire city afraid of me, I'd fuck it up for sure. Uh, you know, I'd probably have too much to drink one night, overhear some people talking about, you know, reading about me in the papers, and eventually I'd be like, you know, it's, uh, that's, that's me. I did that. You know, what, you, what you're just talking about? That's me. It's all me, for real. I'm, I'm Zodiac. <laughs> I'm a Zodiac, so, you know, you don't want to fuck with me. <laughs> can, I, uh, can, I buy you, can I buy you ladies a drink? No, no, hey, go, calm down. I'm not, I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to kill you. I just want to talk to you, you know, about uh, other, other people that I have killed. Where are you, why are you leaving? Come on, don't, don't do that. Let me, let me get you a drink. Stick around, and uh, stick around, and I'll write, I'll write the next letter while you're here. While we can write it together. Stick around. Why are you calling the police? If they catch me, you're not going to have a mystery anymore. Come on, come on. Don't, don't make me hogtie you. Do not make me hogtie you. This is how you people get killed. You know, be fucking, I, I would just, I'm amazed that a, a murderous lunatic could keep a secret like this. Well, while the cipher was unable to be decoded by authorities at the time, later code breakers will claim to decode it. And we'll talk about one of those code breakers later in this episode. 
who broke it in a, in a in a way that makes sense to me. Uh, we'll see if it makes sense to you. See if you feel like it's legit. Uh, November 9th, 1969, day after that, I just washed my pen card. The Zodiac sent a seven-page letter to the San Francisco Chronicle. It starts with, this is the Zodiac speaking. Up to the end of October, I have killed seven people. I have grown rather angry with the police for their telling lies about me. So I shall change the way of the change the way the collecting of slaves. I shall no longer announce to anyone. When I commit my murders, they shall look like routine robberies, killings of anger, a few fake accidents, etc. And then he goes on to, to say the sketch artist's description of him is, is a disguise, and he only looks like that when he kills. He says he's never left a fingerprint because he wears transparent finger guards comprised of two layers of model airplane glue applied to his fingerprints. Talks about leaving false clues at crime scenes to throw off investigators because he likes, quote, needling the blue pigs. He talks about how close the police came to catching him after the taxi driver murder. He even claims that some police spoke to him 10 minutes after the homicide, asked him if he'd seen anyone suspicious, and then he sent them on a wild goose chase. If that did happen, the police didn't report it. Uh, he states, hey, pig, doesn't it rile you up to have your nose rubbed in your boo-boos? God, this guy's a real ass. He refers to his earlier school bus threats, writing, if you cops think I'm going to take on a bus the way I stated I was, you deserve to have holes in your heads. And then he alludes to bombing school buses with a homemade bomb, a.k.a. a death machine. And he claims to have uh, stored this death machine in his basement, and he lists the ingredients uh, for this bomb. Clearly, this guy has issues with authority. You get the feeling he enjoys fucking with the cops more than he actually enjoys killing people. And then on December 20th, 1969, the first anniversary of the Lake Herman Road murders, the Zodiac sends another later letter, this one to the home address of prominent attorney Melvin Bly, the attor attorney he just spoke to that we heard. And he writes, Dear Melvin, this is the Zodiac speaking. I wish you a happy Christmas. The one thing I ask you is this. Please help me. I cannot reach out for help because of this thing in me won't let me. I am finding it extremely difficult to hold it in check. I am afraid I will lose control and take my ninth and possibly tenth victim. Please help me. I am drowning. At the moment, the children are safe from the bomb because it is so massive to dig in and the trigger mech requires much work to get it adjusted just right. But if I hold back too long from no, from no nine, I will lose all control myself and set the bomb up. Please help me. I cannot remain in control for much longer. And then he signs it with a symbol and attaches another piece of taxi driver Paul Stein's bloody shirt to prove authenticity. Uh, well, someone claiming to be the Zodiac uh, had also called Bly's residence a couple days earlier on December 18th, claiming that it was his birthday. This detail of the birthday being December 18th is important and will come up again later when we talk about suspects. March 22nd, 1970, Kathleen Johns claims that her and her infant daughter are kidnapped by the Zodiac killer on Highway 132 near Patterson, California. Claims that her life was threatened for two hours, that she was finally able to flee. But this claim, while prominently included in the Zodiac movie, likely never happened. He, he, the Zodiac killer was not one to hang, uh, hang for a few hours with a victim and then just, you know, let him, let him get away. While John's claim publicly to have been threatened, uh, police reports of the event uh, do not back up this claim. And while the Zodiac killer would, would later claim responsibility for this incident in a future letter, he would also fail to provide any crime details that weren't already publicly available, like he had done with past attacks. So probably not a real Zodiac attack. Uh, on April 20th, 1970, the Zodiac killer sent another letter to the San Francisco Chronicle claiming 10 total victims and offering a cipher that supposedly revealed his name, but one that has never been solved. Uh, he ends the letter with a score, Zodiac 10, SFPD 0, just over a week later, on April 28th, he sends another letter to the San Francisco Chronicle, a greeting card where he again references wanting to blow up a bus. He also asked the, uh, the paper to ask its readers to start wearing buttons with the Zodiac symbol on them, st stating, everyone else has these buttons like Black Power, Melvin Eats Blubber, etc. Well, it would cheer me up considerably if I saw a lot of people wearing my button. Please no nasty ones like Melvin's. Thank you. Signed with the Zodiac symbol. So apparently there was... Some, some other causes that had buttons around town, some save the whale. I don't know. I don't know what the Melvin Blubber one. I didn't think it was worth looking into. Who gives a shit? Some fucking blubber cause, some black, uh, the black power cause, and, uh, and he would like a button. What a delusional nut. What an odd request for a murderer, right? What a strange, he's, he's been coming across like an evil genius, and then he makes this weird button turn, just, first I will kill several innocent people. Yes, yes, that is stage one for my plan for total domination of the Bay Area. Spilling the blood of the innocents. And then stage two, 
I would taunt the police and the papers with threatening letters and undecipherable codes. Yes, I will baffle. I will terrify millions. And then, oh, stage three, buttons. Oh, the sweet buttons. I will awake to see hundreds of thousands of my little crosshair zodiac symbol buttons worn by adults and children alike. And the police, uh, most most likely, most of all the police, mostly the police will wear my little ten buttons on their uniforms, but no less than ten, but also no more than twenty. That's too many buttons. Uh, it would start to look silly if someone had like a hundred zodiac buttons. And it would, you know, then it would feel patronizing. And then, you know... Uh, and then you know, once once the entire city is wearing the proper amount of my buttons, stage four. And stage four, <laughs> stage four is, um, uh, stage, uh, I have, I've thought of it, stage four is more buttons, but a different color and size of button. First, you will wear, wear my small buttons. Then you will wear a larger, different colored button. And then, uh, finally, I will have a successful button business, which is all I ever wanted in the first I don't know. Uh, weird. Weird button shit. So, uh, 1970, more letters flow into the Chronicle. Uh, a letter postmarked June 26, 1970. He complains that he's, he's bummed out that no, <laughs> that no one's wearing his buttons. There's fucking buttons in this guy. He actually writes, I am rather unhappy because you people will not wear some nice Zodiac buttons. Really hung up on the whole button thing. Uh, he claims another murder. Uh, in a letter to the Chronicle post, postmarked July 24th, 1970, the Zodiac takes credit for Kathleen John's abduction as well. You know, do, do you want me to kill? Is that what you want? Do you have any idea how infuriating to walk all over town and not see a single fucking button anywhere is? I must have seen a thousand buttons yesterday, a hundred alone for the Grateful Dead. None for me. I, I even saw some, some CCR buttons. What the fuck? Uh, July 26th, 1970 letter, the Zodiac paraphrased a song from the Mikado. Uh, later 19th century British opera, adding his own lyrics about making a little list of the ways he's planned to torture his slaves in paradise. His current score is Zodiac 13, SFPD 0. Card was sent on October 7th to the Chronicle with a skeleton on the front and the words, From your secret pal, I feel it in my bones. You ache to know my name, and so I'll clue, and so I'll clue in, dot, dot, dot. And then on the back it says, By fire, by gun, by knife, by rope, paradise slaves. Kind of in this weird, paradise slaves are like, Paradise is running vertically, slaves are running horizontally through them, forming that little kind of zodiac symbol. And then the other ones, are, it's, it's like it's strangely arranged, all those words. October 27th, 1970, Chronicle reporter Paul Avery, who had been covering the zodiac case, received a Halloween card signed with the letter Z and the zodiac's cross circle symbol. Handwritten on the card was a note Peekaboo, you are doomed. <laughs> Scared the shit out of him. But yeah, of course it would. The threat was taken seriously, received front page story on the Chronicle. Still no buttons, but at least he's getting that, you know, front page treatment he loves. Soon after receiving this letter, Avery receives an anonymous letter alerting him to the similarities between the Zodiac's activities and the unsolved murder of uh, Sherry Joe Bates, which had occurred four years earlier at City College in Riverside in the greater Los Angeles area, more than 400 miles south of San Francisco. He reported his findings in the Chronicle on November 16, 1970. On October 30th, 1966, 18-year-old Sherry Joe Bates, a student at this college, Riverside Community College, spent uh, the evening at campus at the campus library annex until it closed at 9. Neighbors reported hearing a scream around 10.30. Bates was found dead the next morning, a short distance from the library, between two abandoned houses slated to be demolished for campus renovations. The wires in her Volkswagen's distributing cap had been pulled out. She was brutally beaten and stabbed to death. However, police don't believe this was actually a Zodiac murder, despite a fair amount of evidence uh, leaking, linking this crime to the killer. A month later, on November 29, 1966, nearly identical typewritten letters were mailed to the Riverside Police and the Riverside Press Enterprise titled The Confession. The author claimed responsibility for the Bates murder, providing details of the crime that were not released to the public. The author warned that Bates is not the first and she will not be the last. In December 1966, a poem was discovered carved into the bottom side of a desktop in the Riverside City College Library titled Sick of Living, Unwilling to Die. The poem's language and handwriting resembled that of the Zodiac's letters. It was signed with what we, what was assumed to be the initials R.H. During the 1970 investigation, Sherwood Morrill, California's top question documents examiner slash handwriting an, uh, analyst, expressed his opinion that the poem was written by the Zodiac. On April 30, 1967, exactly six months after the Bates murder, Bates' father, Joseph, uh, the Press Enterprise, and the Riverside Police all received nearly identical letters. A handwritten scrawl, uh, the Press Enterprise and police copies read that says, Bates had to die, there will be more. 
with a small scribble at the bottom that resembled the letter Z. Joseph Bates' copy read, She had to die, there will be more, this time without the Z signature. Again, though, because of police investigation information that has never been released, uh, local authorities uh, did not think the Zodiac did it. They had they have a, had another guy that there was their prime suspect, not the Zodiac. They, they I guess, were open to the possibility the Zodiac somehow gained information about these you know, uh, crimes and tried to take credit for them. Others do think the Zodiac probably did do it. So the, these are like, out of the unsolved crimes of the Zodiac, these are like the most unsolved. Uh, on March 22nd, 1971, going back to our, our timeline uh, in the, the chronology of it, a postcard to the Chronicle addressed to reporter Paul Averly, uh, believed to be from the Zodiac, appeared to claim responsibility for the disappearance of Donna Lass on September 6, 1970. It was made from a collage of advertisements and magazine lettering featured a scene from an advertisement for Forest Pines condominiums in the Tech Sierra Club, sought victim 12, peeked through the pines, past Lake Tahoe areas, around in the snow. Zodiac's, uh, Zodiac's cross circle symbol was in both the place of the usual return address and the lower right section of the front face of the postcard. However, uh, no evidence has been uncovered to connect the last disappearance with the Zodiac killer definitively mostly because the body of Lass, a 25-year-old nurse who worked as a fir- at a first aid station for the Sahara Casino, just never been found. In 1974, after the Pines card, the Zodiac remained silent for nearly three years. The Chronicle then received a letter from the Zodiac, postmarked Jan- January 29, 1974, praising The Exorcist as the best satirical comedy that I have ever seen. Weird. Uh, the letter included a snippet of verse from the Mikado again, an unusual symbol at the bottom that has remained unexplained by researchers. Zodiac concluded the letter with a new score, Me 37, SFPD 0. Numerous letters have popped up since, but none have been thought to be produced by the Zodiac by most experts. Even the 1974 one's questionable by some. Some think he did that one, some don't. After that, most think the letters that came in later were not written by the Zodiac killer. So who did it? Uh, who was the Zodiac killer? Uh, let's pop out of this timeline and, and take a little look-see. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. One suspect is the Unabomber. Not even kidding. The Unabomber has been suspected as being a Zodiac, the Zodiac killer. I know it sounds crazy, but Ted Kaczynski, a.k.a. the Unabomber, did live in the Bay Area at the time of the murders. He was clearly homicidal. He wrote letters to the newspapers, as Zodiac did. There's even a website for his connection, the Unizod.com. Bay Area detectives looked into this connection in the mid-'90s. Kaczynski once signed a high school yearbook with a symbol similar to the Zodiacs, and the Zodiac also told one victim that he had resided in Montana near Lincoln, the town Kaczynski lived near when he was arrested in 1996. However, Robert Graysmith of San Francisco, author of the book Zodiac in 1996, uh, Jake Gyllenhaal's character in the movie Zodiac, said the similarities are fascinating but undoubtedly purely coincidental, pointing out that witness descriptions of a paunchy Zodiac did not match the lanky Kaczynski and the pop culture writing style of the Zodiac also does not match the Unabomber's terse, dry prose. And there's Guy Hendrickson in 2009. Deborah Perez stood on a busy San Francisco street corner proclaiming her belief at a little press conference that her father, Guy Ward Hendrickson, Hendrickson, was the notorious Zodiac killer who plagued the San Francisco Bay Area with several murders. But investigation determined that glasses, the glasses did not belong to Stein. Uh, it's Kevin Jones determined that an inspector in the San Francisco Police Department's hom- Homicide Bureau. He said they're not Paul Stein's glasses and added that he's still working on other leads that Perez provided him with uh, during lengthy interviews earlier in the year. Leads ended up going, leads ended up going nowhere, by the way. Deborah Guy Henderson, uh, Hendrickson's stepdaughter claimed Guy took seven-year-old Debbie along on some of his murders, and yeah, and then those claims were just ruled out. The shit some people will do for attention, man, so weird. I, I don't know anything about Deborah other than what I've just told you, but I imagine the kind of, that she's the kind of person that's just so bored with her life that she somehow thinks it'll be fun and exciting to accuse her own stepfather of being a serial killer and then claim to be present during the murders. You know, just make it all up. Man, just get a fucking hobby, lady. Learn to learn to play guitar. Get a lot of free time, apparently. Go on a cruise. Take some Zumba classes or something, you maniac. Then there's David Joseph Carpenter, a.k.a. the Trailside Killer. David was born and raised in San Francisco. Looks somewhat like the sketch artist description of the Zodiac. He was the right age to fit the description. He was sentenced to seven years in prison in 1960 for attempted murder, released two years before the Zodiac killings in the Bay Area. Uh, and then in 1988 was found guilty of killing one man and six California women, uh, found guilty of raping several others. He's, he's believed to have killed several, uh, more victims. And he, again, was in the Bay area during the time of the Zodiac murders. Uh, he was also known to stalk his victims in California state parks 
and he's currently still alive in the San Quentin prison. But his modus operandi uh, uh, did not match the Zodiac killings. And investigators looked into connection and, and ruled him out. And then there's Andre Chikatilo, uh, the butcher of Rostov, who, who may have taken some trips to the Bay Area from Russia in the early uh, in his early 30s to attend, uh, you know, the time of the murders, to attend some workshops that were put on in the area on how to coach teen co-ed wrestling classes. Just I like I like to wrestle. Some some wrestle for victory. I, I mostly wrestle for coming. I want to learn how Americans wrestle children. Maybe try and pin with aggressive thrusting pelvis like I teach in, in private classes back in Rostov. Maybe they jerk limp cock to sweatpants during warm-up to focus mind like I demonstrate in Russia. I do not know. Maybe I try and open the Bay Area button shop. Come to Chikatilo's button factory. Come for button. Stay for tears. Shed over limp shameful hate cock. Okay, Chikatilo is not a Zodiac suspect. I'm just still having uh, fun uh, mocking his voice and impotence. Rick Marshall was a real suspect. Uh, no hard facts tie Rick to any of the killings, but there's a lot of circumstantial evidence. He lived in Riverside near the murder scene of Sherry Joe Bates in 1966. Uh, and then in a basement residence in Scott Street, San Francisco, just a few miles from Washington and Cherry Street, where taxi driver Paul Stein was killed with a single shot to the head. Right? Remember in the Zodiac, one of his letters referenced having a basement, uh, which is not common in California homes. He worked as a projectionist at the Avenue Movie Theater, uh, a place that specialized in silent movies. One of his favorite films was The Red Phantom, a film highlighted in possible Zodiac correspondence uh, when the Red Phantom letter, letter would arrive at the San Francisco Chronicle on July 8, 1974. He possessed a royal typewriter, the kind used to write the typed confession letter sent to Riverside Police in 1966 after the murder of Sherry Joe Bates. He also looked a lot like the police sketch of the killer, fit the description of the killer's size. Like when he was interviewed by police, he would say things like, yeah, no, I, I look like the guy. No, a lot of things, there's a lot of weird circumstances. I mean, I, basically he would say stuff like, I would think I did it too. Uh, he was investigated by Napa County Police Department, uh, but nothing tangible emerged. Marshall was in later years cleared of, from ongoing investigation shortly before his death in Marin County in 2008. He was also subject to an FBI investigation, but his records were expunged in 1993. No files remained. Probably not Rick. Rick, Rick came across to me in my research like a guy who wanted people to believe he was a Zodiac. I, I could see him being a guy who maybe sent in some of the later letters, wanting to keep it going, wanting to keep this attention happening, hoping to have uh, be suspected, you know, knowing that he would not be found guilty because he wasn't actually the dude. And then there's Arthur Lee Allen. Now, historically, this is the name tied most closely uh, closely to Zodiac's suspect list. He's suspect number one. The 2007 David Fincher movie I've referenced, Zodiac, uh, which, again, I think he did a great job of making a real effort to stick to the known facts of the case and most commonly held speculation about the Zodiac killer, strongly implicates, strongly implicates Arthur as being the killer who gets away with it. Uh, the connections and coincidences between Lee and the killings are numerous and creepy and... Uh, and Allen was the only suspect to be served with search warrants by police in this investigation. Strangely, uh, Chikatilo never even considered by the police. Something about him never actually setting foot in America. You know, whatever. Uh, former friend of Lee's, uh, Don Cheney, alerted police to Allen as a possible suspect after numerous conversations he had with Allen before the murders when Lee had supposedly told Cheney he wanted to kill couples at random, call himself Zodiac, use a flashlight attached to his gun to aid hunting at night. There's a documentary you can watch on YouTube called His Name Was Arthur Lee Allen that really makes you wonder if he was, in fact, the, the guy. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of the uh, the footage is just an interview with Don Cheney, who clearly, clearly, clearly believes this was a guy. And if what he was saying is true, then he was the guy. But, you know, it's a, kind of a he said, she said. We just have his, his word. Then there's the persistent rumor that Lee could have been one of those un unidentified guys who showed up uh, to Zodiac victim Darlene Farron's house painting party. You know, back in 1969, uh, Lee lived in that area, and there is a Vallejo police report that mentions that Darlene's sister, Linda, said that a man named Lee would bring Darlene gifts from trips he'd taken uh, to Tijuana, Mexico around that time. Uh, Alan did own a Zodiac watch adorned with the now famous crosshair symbol, a watch given to him by his mother in 67. Uh, he had connections with the U.S. Navy after uh, uh, enlisting in 1957, which could have linked him. To, to be able to get those wing walkers, the military style boot, he was a, a size 10 and a half. You know, remember those foot impressions in the Lake uh, Berryessa attacks on, on Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard. You know, he wore the right shoes. And plus, in a confession uh, to police, he did reveal that he was in possession of knives that were covered in blood on the day of that those attacks uh, in Lake Berryessa. Um, he stated that they were, they were used to kill a chicken, which is uh, fucking weird. To me, like who drives out, I know where this is maybe a little bit country again, but who drives out and just, uh, 
you know, just finds a fucking chicken wandering around, kills it with some knives, and then just leaves the knives in their car. I don't know. That seems that seems very odd to me. Uh, he also owned a royal typewriter, you know, which police removed from his his home, similar to the one that produced the confession letter in, in connection to the unsolved stabbing of Sherry Joe Bates outside the Riverside City College. You know, that sixty six killing. Plus, he was identified as the killer by Michael uh, Majo, who survived the attack at Blue Rock Springs Park in Vallejo in July fourth, nineteen sixty nine. Although he did not identify him until nineteen ninety two, for whatever reason in the investigation, his residence at thirty two Fresno Street was located just ten minutes, uh, a ten minute walk from the payphone at the corner of the Springs Road and Tulum intersection, where the Zodiac made his first call to police. He was uh, fired from the Calaveras Unified School District in nineteen sixty eight. Uh, you know, shortly before that first killing, after he allegedly mol- molested a child and lost his teaching credentials, because that explained his uh, his later threats to blow up school buses, maybe explain his his sudden anger towards authority in the world. Uh, Darlene Farron, the, the you know, had, had worked on Tennessee Street in Vallejo, which was just about one block from the bottom of Allen's residence at 32 Fresno Street. A police report at the time highlighted that somebody uh, by the name of Lee was apparently often seen in the company of Darlene, and then Don Cheney again stated that, you know, Alan had mentioned to him that he was fond of a waitress at the restaurant, at that waffle restaurant where Darlene worked. Ar- uh, Arthur Lee Allen often went by the name of Lee, uh, actually spelled it as Lee, uh, L-E-E. Uh, his middle name was actually spelled L-E- L-E-I-G-H. Uh, and he would go by Lee often. A team of investigators um, were actually about to charge Lee with some of the murders after uh, Majo identified Allen as the killer in 1992, but then a month later, he he was found dead on the floor of his 32 Fresno Street Vallejo residence. Uh, Detective George Ballwart would say, I am 95% sure it was him. It is because so many coincidences point in his direction. What really bothers me about this case is that we were ready to charge Arthur Lee Allen with the idea in mind that it would be taken to a trial so that 12 jurors could make that determination, but he died before we could do that. So it took a long time to get all their ducks in a row, but they were actually going to charge him. According to statements uh, to police by family and friends prior to the publication of Zodiac's codes, Allen had possession of codes featuring identical symbols. Additionally, Allen was known to use the same unusual spelling and phrasing as the Zodiac used in some of his letters, such as spelling, you know, Christmas with two S's, saying trigger mech instead of trigger mechanism on September 27th, 1974, uh, Allen was arrested by the Sonoma County Sheriff's Department on a, on a charge of child molestation. He'd be found guilty to go to prison until 1977. Now, remember, 1974 is the last year a letter most uh, believe was definitely written by the Zodiac Killer. So that's a hell of a coincidence. And his birthday, December 18th, the very same birthday the caller claiming to be the Zodiac claimed to have when he called Melvin Bly, that attorney, in 1969. So a lot of evidence, a lot of circumstantial evidence. Why wasn't he charged? Well, first of all, various handwriting analysts stated that, you know, his handwriting just didn't match the handwriting found on the Zodiac letters. Uh, Don Cheney, though, and others had an explanation for this. They said that he was ambidextrous, and Cheney swears he could write very well with both hands. He thinks that Lee uh, normally, you know, or uh, normally, sorry, he didn't think this. Lee normally wrote with his left hand, uh, and then Cheney thought that he would write the Zodiac letters with his right hand. Now, Lee did provide writing samples from both hands to investigators, and handwriting analysis ruled out both hands, but, you know, I think he could have fooled investigators. You know, he could have just wrote extra shitty with his other hand in front of them for that submission. You know, he wasn't a dummy. He actually scored a 135 at an IQ test in his early 20s, five points below genius, uh, according to an article I found in the East Bay Times. Uh, also, he, he wasn't investigated further early on because DNA and fingerprints lifted from several items connected with the Zodiac crimes failed to produce a match with Lee, including fingerprints retrieved from the taxi cab murder of Paul Stein on October 11th, 1969, a palm print lifted from the exorcist letter on January 29th, 1974, in 2002 DNA extracted from the stamps and envelopes from Zodiac letters failed to implicate Allen. He also passed a polygraph examination during his initial investigation. However, I'd still pick him as the killer if I had to choose. If I was forced to pick a guilty party based on uh, which dude looks the creepiest out of the suspects, I would actually definitely pick Arthur Lee Allen. Uh, He looks like a serial killer. He looks creepy. He does fit the physical description of Zodiac. Uh, He's the most likely suspect, but now he's dead. Uh, And there's a good chance, you know, we'll never know for sure. I did find one more piece of interesting information incriminating him, though. Uh, It was that cipher sent to the Chronicle on November 8th, 1969, the uh, the one that wasn't decoded. Well, a Massachusetts man named Corey Starliper claims to have cracked the code in 2012. Uh, he was inspired 
initially by that 2007 David Fincher movie, Zodiac. Then he read Robert Graysmith's books about the killer. And then and here's what he came up with. Here's what he says that cipher says. Kill, self, doctor, help, me, kill, myself, gas, chamber. Then an unintelligible word. Days, questionable, every waking moment. I'm alive, my pride lost, I can't go on living in this way, killing people, I have killed so many people, can't help myself, I'm so angry, I could do my thing, I'm alone in this world, my whole life full of lies, I'm unable to stop, by the time you solve this, I will have killed 11 people, please help me stop killing people, please, my name is Bojangles, motherfucker! That's right. We do know who the Zodiac Killer was, and it was none other than Bojangles, three-legged, one-eyed pit bull hellhound of occasional terror. That's why the handwriting never matched anyone, because it wasn't handwriting. It was paw writing, okay? Why did he do it? Well, because the investigators failed to mention there are many reports that all five Zodiac victims were die-hard pinko Russian communists intent on bringing America and freedom to its knees. And why did he taunt the police? Well, because they were in on it. They weren't real cops. They were free-loving, pot-smoking, hippie people wishing they could live in some kind of communal communist compound, and he was fucking sick of it. San Francisco had gotten a little too anti-capitalist in the final days of the 60s, and Bojangles needed to remind everyone that if they didn't value life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as he saw it, he'd replace it with death, weird afterlife slave references, fear, and possibly a lot of fucking buttons! No, of course not. That's not what happened. That's not what the code revealed. The code actually did reveal, after all that, the name to be Lee Allen. So that's pretty big uh, to me. However, other code crackers did not come to Starlipers. Uh, same conclusion. Authorities uh, have not responded to his, his many requests to explain how he cracked the code. So who knows? A lot of shit out there. A lot of stuff about the Zodiac. You could get lost for days, weeks, months. Hell, people have uh, been obsessed with definitively proving who did it for their entire adult lives. And still, uh, what I presented is what I believe to be the most credible stuff out there. If I missed something you felt was important, send it in to, uh, to Bojangles at timesuckpodcast.com, and it may show up in a future Time Sucker update. So before we get to the top five takeaways, there is one last suspect to discuss. Texas Senator and former presidential candidate Ted Cruz. And to examine his connection to the Zodiac Killer, we must check in with the idiots of the internet. Idiots of the internet. Under a video titled, Ted Cruz is Zodiac Killer.mov, posted in February of 2016, YouTube user Mazers Racers posted, thank you for spreading the truth. It seems like this should be a bigger news story. And then there are countless comments under numerous Zodiac Killer videos that say something to the effect of, Ted Cruz is definitely the Zodiac Killer. Under a video titled, Ted Cruz admits he's the Zodiac Killer, Real, posted in February of 2016, Aron Harper writes, do you guys realize he wasn't even born yet the last time the Zodiac Killer was active? To which Diana Acosta replies, you do realize he could have easily faked his birth certificate. That's right. Ted Cruz was born on December 22nd, 1970, over a year after the last confirmed Zodiac killing. And yet some people actually think he could still be the killer. A 2016 poll taken in Florida revealed that 38% of the people questioned believed that Ted Cruz could be the Zodiac Killer. Asked point blank, do you think Ted Cruz is a Zodiac killer or not? 10% said yes. Another 20%, uh, 28% said they weren't sure. Where did this belief come from? Well, according to knowyourmeme.com on March 14th, 2013, the Twitter feed at Red Pill America posted a tweet claiming that an upcoming Cruz speech would be titled, This is the Zodiac Speaking the name of a documentary. Then on, on November 10th, 2014, Twitter user at Flash2844 tweeted that Cruz's, uh, tr Cruz's deathbed confession would be, I am the Zodiac Killer, along with the hashtag, Ted Cruz is the Zodiac Killer. On December 15th, 2015, uh, a Facebook page titled Ted Cruz is the Zodiac Killer was launched, garnering upwards of 9,400 likes over the next two months. January 20th, Twitter user, uh, 2016, Twitter user at Linzetta posted a fake quote of Cruz confessing to the Zodiac Killer murders. That evening, Twitter user at Zeppel Wilbury tweeted that Cruz was born in Calgary, Canada, and that the Zodiac Killer's final victims were named Cal and Gary. And it just kept building and building and building from there, getting more absurd. Memes are being spread around, and it goes truly viral. And yet some people, uh, people like user Diana Acosta, even when confronted with the fact that he was born after the murders were committed, still seem to think he actually did it. 
all because of some random person's, you know, random comedic tweet. User, uh, YouTube user Dude Bro Buddy, <laughs> real username, says under another video accusing Ted Cruz of being the Zodiac, online, I saw a theory that Ted is from the past, so he's a time traveler. And he, <laughs> and he came to the future, and he really is the Zodiac killer, but we're giving him that idea of becoming the Zodiac killer. And underneath this post, user Lady Running says, there's nothing wrong with wanting a serial killer as president. What in the fuck are you two talking about? Instead of just accepting the obvious truth that it is mathematically impossible for Ted Cruz to be the Zodiac, you jump to time travel. Something else that may end up proving to be impossible to carry out. And then someone else uh, thinks that there's not a problem with a serial killer for a president. I think there are a lot of problems with that. I think, you know, we all make mistakes. You know, just because maybe you tried some drugs when you were younger or weren't faithful to a spouse or got a DUI or committed some misdemeanors, you know, when you're younger, I think you should still be able to maybe run for president if you've proven that you've learned from those mistakes. But uh, killing a series of strangers and then taunting the police and victims' families about it for years, I think that disqualifies you. I think that's going to come up, you know, in the debates and, and hurt your, you know, nomination chances. So, Mr. Cruz, when dealing with a member of Congress ideologically opposed to your legislative agendas, do you think you'll be willing to compromise and still pass some form of your original legislation? Or do you think you'll hogtie and stab them and then send some cryptic letters to the press as you've done previously? Now, look, I know a lot of YouTube posts are left there by kids, and there's a lot of posts left there by trolls who don't mean what they say. However, some of these people do mean what they say, and that's scary. It's scary that 10% of people pulled to Florida thought Ted Cruz was definitely the Zodiac killer. These are probably people who, who heard of the meme associating Ted Cruz with the Zodiac, but, but didn't uh, keep listening until it got to the part, but it's just a joke. And those people terrified me. And there's a lot of those people, people who, you know, they hear crazy shit that someone posts on the web and they do zero critical analysis of the information. People with weak logic and critical thinking skills, but strong breeding capabilities. People who, who don't think, but do fuck often. People who don't research their opinions but do pass on their opinions to their kids and vote and teach and actively participate in their communities. And that is why I love it when you people call me on my mistakes and you help me get smarter. You help me learn. You help me evolve. And when you tell me how much you enjoy learning something yourself, uh, something new, and having discussions, intellectual discussions about it with other time suck people, you know, talking about other time suck topics, you remind me that not everyone is an idiot of the internet. All right, so what do we think about the Zodiac? Uh, I think I understand why some people are obsessed. You know, it's a really rare example of someone not only committing horrible crimes and getting away with it, but also taunting the police, taunting the press over and over for several years and still getting away with that. And, and on top of all that, sending in ciphers and daring the world to crack codes revealing their identity. It's, it's like something out of a movie, some weird supervillain harassing an entire city, you know? It feels like some, like the Joker or something harassing Gotham, except it's not a movie, it, it really happened. And then, it, and then, you know, and then it turned into a great movie. Mysteries like this bother us, I think, for several reasons. We don't like someone not ever receiving justice for committing the ultimate crime, murder. It reminds us that the world is definitely not fair. Sometimes karma is not a bitch. Sometimes bad people are never punished for their crimes. And also, it doesn't feel good to be presented with a puzzle like a cipher and not be able to solve it. Like, I remember the rage I would feel as a kid trying to complete a jigsaw puzzle and not be able to find the piece I needed. Like, it made me feel like a complete idiot, like a helpless moron, like a failure. Well, the Zodiac gave that feeling to millions and for some still is giving that feeling to them. In situations like this, uh, I like to pretend that maybe the real killer was killed by another sadistic killer and his body has just never been found. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be nice? Kind of poetic? Or at the very least, if it was someone like Arthur Lee Allen, I, I hope it ate away at him every day for the rest of his miserable fucking life. I hope it devoured any and all joy and happiness he might ever feel again. I hope the burden of those murders just haunted him, just wore him down into that heart failure, you know? Because it, because worst case is that he did do it and just didn't give a shit. It didn't bother him one bit. He loved all the attention and had a great life. That is an outcome that is both sadly possible and horribly unsettling. Okay, so now time for one final look at the Zodiac this week with some top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, the Zodiac killed five people and wounded two others between December 1968 and October 1969, may have killed countless more, putting his body count at 37 in the last letter thought to have probably come from him, sent into the San Francisco Chronicle 
in 1974. Number two, Zodiac survivor Brian Hartnell is one tough son of a bitch. The guy was stabbed half a dozen times with a roughly foot-long knife, and then after that, after playing dead, untied himself, somehow got loose from being hogtied, and walked away and got help. Number three, the most likely suspect is the only one the police ever obtained a search warrant for, Arthur Lee Allen, who likely knew Zodiac victim Darlene Farron, lived very close to where she worked, was in the right area for all the other murders, fit the description, had the right shoe size, the right birthday, and amongst many other pieces of circumstantial evidence, went to prison at a time that coincided with the end of the Zodiac letters. He was also years later identified by one of the survivors of a Zodiac attack. Number four, Ted Cruz is not the Zodiac. Like, for sure. 100% not him. Absolutely not for sure. Number five, new info. The History Channel will be premiering a new five-part miniseries called The Hunt for the Zodiac Killer on Tuesday, November 14th, 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, the show features a team of top investigators and codebreakers working in tandem with a supercomputer known as Carmel, the first of its kind program to think like a killer. And the show may be a complete piece of shit, maybe a, a complete waste of time. Uh, the History Channel is not sponsoring me in any way. Uh, I just know a lot of you are really into this topic and, and I wanted to make you aware of this show. Uh, if it sucks, don't blame me. I, if it sucks in a bad way. If it sucks in a good way, I'll take credit. Uh, I can't vouch for it uh, because I feel like the History Channel is very hit and miss. But, um, you know, after doing this research, I am interested. Uh, if they do, though, conclude uh, after their analysis that it was, in fact, Ted Cruz, I myself may take a gun and start killing random History Channel executives and then sending in my own ciphers to whoever is still alive at the History Channel. Time suck. Top five takeaways. All right, everybody. So that was the Zodiac Suck. I hope you enjoyed it. Special thanks to Time Suckers, Grant Olson, Mac, Mike Walters, Haley Sedell, Colton Black, Drew Fitzpatrick, Ben, Tim Epps, Micah, Mike Moses, Larry Hood, Brandon Weimer, Sam Clark, David Liu, John Stuhlreiner, and I'm sure many others I've missed for suggesting the Zodiac. And the one name, Stuhl, Stuhl Dreher. I don't know, John. Sorry, I'm sure I butchered your name, and I'm sure you're used to it, because that's a crazy one. Uh, extra big thanks to Sydney Shives for managing all the Time Suck emails week in and week out. Uh, it's a blessing to have on the team. Uh, time Sucker Mike Jernigan has had some horrible medical problems lately. Uh, he's a diehard Time Sucker, man. One of the first frequent messenger, uh, yeah, into the show, and messenger. I think I said messenger. That'd be weird. He's a frequent messenger into the show. And, and just a good dude. I've met in person a few times at some shows. And uh, I will have a link to his GoFund campaign uh, in the episode description. He just had some horrible, horrible, unlucky infection situations go on. So if you want to help out another time sucker going through some medical uh, maladies, you can you can find that in the episode description. Excited to step away from the darkness and suck on uh, something positive this coming Monday. Suck on a real-life goddamn hero, Chesty Puller. Lewis Burwell, Chesty Puller, born in June 26th, 1898, died on October 11th, 1971. He was a U.S. Marine Corps Lieutenant General who fought guerrillas in Haiti and Nicaragua in World War II, fought in the Korean War as well. And Puller's the most decorated Marine in American history. Uh, he's one of two U.S. servicemen to be awarded five Navy crosses. And uh, with the Distinguished Service Cross awarded to him by the U.S. Army, his total of six uh, stand only behind World War I fighter pilot Eddie Rickenbacker's eight military awards for valor. And I know almost nothing about Chesty right now, but I'm going to know a lot uh, Monday. It's going to be a, a fun Veterans Day kind of week presentation for the suck, and I, I'm really uh, eager to learn about this American hero. Hope you are as well. And finally, thanks for the continued PayPal donation. So generous. Thanks for choosing the link to Amazon from timesuckpodcast.com. Help the show. Thanks for buying Timesuck hats and shirts, etc. Trying to find time to get some new designs uh, into the pipeline. Uh, hoping to do that very soon. Just getting kind of getting some time suck infrastructure set up so I can stay on top of stuff. Uh, all right. Let's catch up on previous episodes and recent happenings. Some shadow people shit with some time sucker updates. Updates. Get your time sucker updates. Okay. So let's talk about shadow people. As promised earlier. Uh, this first uh, Shadow People encounter is sent in from the UK, where there is a growing body of time suckers. God, I hope it builds uh, enough where I can do some shows over there one of these days. Hail Nimrod. This is from Manj Sangha. I hope I'm saying your name right, Manj. Uh, Hail Nimrod, King of the Suck, Lord of the Suckers, the OG of Sucking. Heard the Shadow People podcast today, and now the sun has gone down. I'm already shitting myself for when it comes to bedtime. Going to sleep tonight with the news on. For some fucked up reason, having the news on makes me feel safe from harm. 
Fuck knows why. Anyway, I digress. About 20 years ago, a friend of mine was seeing a girl. They'd go out drinking. When the night was over, they'd go back to her flat and get down <laughs> to some jiggery pokery. I love jiggery pokery. Uh, in her bedroom, I didn't know him at the time, but he told us that when they were making some sweet music, Michael motherfucking McDonald style, he always, he always thought someone, or more precisely, something uh, was was above her wardrobe and was watching him. Ugh. He said it was real dark at the top of the cupboard, uh, but he felt some sort of presence. Uh, as he was a stoner, and he was always half cut, he was pissed, uh, which is drunk for, for you Americans who know no British slang. He thought it was just his imagination, so he never mentioned it to her. After they split up, he bumped into her at a local pub, brought this up with her. He told her that he always thought they were being watched, even when no one else was in the flat and the curtains were drawn. As you can imagine, he absolutely shat his pants when she said she felt the same thing too, being watched by something from the top of the wardrobe when they were together. That is fucking creepy that, it was, that she felt it was from the same spot or when she was on her own. He didn't touch her or approach her, just watched. She said once they split up and he wasn't over on the weekend, she moved out as she didn't feel comfortable. I do believe they were being watched by a shadow person who was slow stroking his misty cock getting off on what he was seeing. I've sent him the link for the episode. Hopefully he'll take the time to listen and conclude that he has experienced for real the shadow people. Looking forward to the Zodiac Killer bonus suck. Hope you hope you did enjoy it. Loving the podcast. Keep on sucking. Hail Nimrod. Manj. And then uh, even though the name in the email earlier was Sangha, it's, it's Hanslow. Hanslow. H-O-U-N-S-L-O-W. Hanslow uh, from the UK. Well, thank you, man. Thank you very much. Uh, man, a shadow stroker. I think you should tell your friend that it was Chikatilo. That's, it, it had to be. It's Andre Chikatilo, the, the butcher of Rostov. It's, it was the shadow butcher. I know it. Just what what big deal? I shadow stroke shadow cock in corner of room. I, I shadow, I, sometimes I shadow stroke uh, up high. I sneak. I sneak ab- above cupboard, top of cupboard, and, and, and I stay there. It's, it's no big deal. I just, I, sometimes I shadow come a little shadow dust on top of cupboard when it bothers no one. I don't understand the fuss. Uh, who bothered by limp, playful shadow dick? Uh, so yeah, so that's my take. Is it a shadow chikatilo? Now here's a scary one uh, from Chet Manlier. Time sucker name is Chet Manlier. That's a fucking name. That's a chesty puller type name. I feel like if your name is Chet Manlier, you better be able to do shitload of push-ups. Can't be Chet Manlier and have just a couple nipples on some ribs for chest. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Okay, anyway, holy fuck balls, Bojangles, is what Chet writes. I just listened to the Shadow People episode, and you're a dick. While listening to this, sitting in my shitty cubicle, trying to edit photos, you get into this topic. Allow me to elaborate on the name calling. Going back to about a year and a half ago, I was talking with my wife, whose mother-like best friend is a paranormal enthusiast, about how the house we were staying in had a spirit we only knew as Mary. Mary was an old woman that had passed away in the house years prior, but never seemed to be a malicious or evil spirit. I said I knew about her, but never really encountered her. It may have been a couple nights since then, but one night I met Mary. I was sleeping, and it was around 3 a.m. when I was woken up by a heavy-ass pressure on my chest, completely immobilized and unable to catch my breath. It lasted for about 30 seconds. Best guess. Afterward, my wife woke up to erratic to my erratic breathing, and I told her I had met Mary and immediately fell back asleep. I didn't feel threatened, as I believed it was her way of saying, hey, fuck, here I am, and let it go. Now, about three months after that, I had another experience. To provide backstory, we were going through a rough patch, and I'm far from religious, thus opening up my spirit to outside influence. Her friend's words, not mine. My next encounter was far more scary. I would say it was again around 3 a.m., and I woke up only to find I could not move but could see. I watched as, as, as a dark figure... Being about four foot tall, wearing a dark blue Victorian era dress with a high collar, long sleeves, and white lace around the neck and cuffs of the sleeves. There was no face, only darkness as if shadow filling the dress. She entered the room through the window slash wall and then moved in a quick like motion from the window around the foot of the bed. <laughs> Motherfucker, I'm getting the chills again. I thought this scary shit was over. And approached my side of the bed. Once she was at my side, she reached with her hand and proceeded to smother my face while beginning while beginning to fillet me with rapid movement. I was petrified. I tried with every ounce of strength to move my hand over to wake my wife, but I couldn't move at all. My breathing now closer to hyperventilating, my wife woke up and tried to wake me. She didn't see my eyes open, and I thought I was sleeping. Oh, I thought I was sleeping. When I told her I was awake for a few minutes and was trying to wake her, she freaked the fuck out and went outside to calm down and catch my breath. According to her friend, I was attacked by a succubus. Being that I was depressed and had no faith in anything, that makes for an open soul for them to attach to. So being that I've never been one to believe ghost stories and such, I now carry my jar of dirt 
<laughs> of crystals and sage to cleanse my being, my house, and anything I can. That shit is real. Scary real. Like it changed my outlook on all things we can't rationally explain. I'm all about science, but holy my, holy my fucking McDonald. There is a whole spectrum of shit we can't see or explain. The scarier part of all of this is when my brother came to visit us a few months after and he proceeded to tell us about when he was in high school and home before our parents, how he was in his room fucking himself. <laughs> interesting way to phrase masturbation and a spirit slash shadow person of the same description appeared in his room being that my brother walks a different path in life he didn't even stop what he was doing and asked her if she was just going to watch or she was just going to join in whether he actually said that or not is anybody's guess but i could absolutely see him saying that after his story with a matching description of the shadow figure my wife and i freaked out moral of the story whether you're sleeping or literally (laughs) fucking yourself they are here real and apparently very unafraid of us keep on sucking hail nimrod now go back onto your scheduled daily distractions. I love that I picked these two at random. I picked there was a bunch of uh, um, shadow people, you know, encounters sent in. I just grabbed a couple from different chunks of when emails came in, with no idea that both of them would involve uh, some weird sex stuff. All right, one more. O oh, exalted King Cummins, magnificent! The aroma of that which thou hast and doth steppeth in be exceedingly sweet and pleasing in mine humble estimation. I love the emails you guys write. The language you use cracks my shit up. Seriously, great work. Just wanted you to know that. It's interesting how the more paranormal topics you cover, the smoother the edge on your skepticism seems to become. I think that's a good thing. This is the cult of the curious after all, and you couldn't be our leader with a narrow and exclusionary mind. Uh, I do agree. Uh, and since fringe phenomena will always fascinate, it can't hurt your listenership either, especially since you seem to have grown a bit more accepting over the course of this project. Keep in mind that human flight was a stuff of fantasy and failure before the Wright brothers. We went from that first flight, there probably were others lost to ancient history, but fuck them, in 1903 to aerial combat in World War I in less than a decade to supersonic flight to space in an incredibly short time. Point is, just because we haven't yet figured out how to qualify something doesn't make it preposterous or even unlikely. We still have a lot to learn about everything. I mentioned before that I grew up in a haunted house, which I and my mom and brother will always maintain is true. I also said that experience helped force my mind open, and I believe that's true too. And uh, yeah, because this is uh, referring to a previous email. I, I'll never try to convince a devout non-believer, not, not, nor will one of them ever change my mind. That's just the nature of belief. The difference is that mine is rooted in experience. Theirs is a lack thereof. It works the same for the devout who believe in their hearts that Jesus, Allah, or whomever has manifested in their lives, aided and guided them and related their experiences, etc. But I remain unconvinced because I haven't had that. So it goes. Here's a quick story that's close to home, though. Remember those hikers who got lost in Joshua Tree this summer? I do, actually. A close friend of mine was on the crew that spent every weekend since with the guy's dad looking for them in some of the most rugged and confusing terrain on the planet, and they recently located them. They were very close to an area that had already been combed over, and in fact, my friend E had scouted that canyon from rim... Uh, from the rim and thought it was just too gnarly for anyone to have made their way into. The search was set to move to a different location the next week, but a clairvoyant was called in, and he was there as she worked over the topographical map with her wand and pendulum and marked a spot. So they went back. He said that within minutes of arriving at the spot, she pointed out they'd started finding clues, a bottle of urine, a little alien head gram bag, uh, grab bag, uh, a partial bag of jerky that coyotes and ravens somehow missed. And from where the first clue was located, he could have thrown a baseball to where their bodies laid. He told me this yesterday, said it still gives him chills thinking about how spot on the woman was hanging around a couple of corpses for most of the day, waiting for the Rangers to release him from the scene. Didn't phase him. So there you go. But he was phased by the uh, this lady's prediction. So there you go, suck lord. Inexplicable events are a part of our world, and the beauties in their mystery. Maybe someday we'll be able to buy some uh, appliance to repel ghosts, or find out that a good stun gun will send a shadow man packing better than knife. I bet, <laughs> probably, or figure out the process by which clairvoyance works. But in the meantime, I love that there's still much we don't fucking know. If you have time for casual listening, there's a great podcast called Spooked. It's a spinoff from Snap Judgment. Real stories told by real people, not all paranormal, but it leans that way. Sorry for the rant. Thanks for freaking me out. I'm alone at a field station in the Mojave, one point one and a half hours from the nearest town, police, EMT. What could go wrong? Rest that throat. You have a lot of sucking to do yet. Sincerely, Reverend Handyman G.B. Green, Junior Esquire Gynecologist. <laughs> oh, man, thank you, Reverend Handyman Green. Uh, yeah, I am softening, man, on the paranormal. Uh, I am for sure. I- I- I'm not going to run around saying I believe for sure. Uh, I'm still going to, you know, analytically approach things, but open to the possibility that there is shit that cannot be explained going on around us. So, so thanks for those updates. Next time, suckers.
suckers. I needed that. We all did. That's all for today, Time Suckers. Hope you had a nice Halloween. Uh, follow the suck on social media, Time Suck Podcast, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And get those Detroit tickets. Get them, get them quick. Uh, if you can make it to that show, it'll help so much uh, getting the live podcasts going. And stay away from dark, secluded makeout spots and keep on sucking.